How are we all doing today? You're good? Excellent. Very, very exciting graduation for you today because we will graduate our 500th North Northcoder. 508th North Dakota, to be precise. So since we did our course in 2000, we started doing this course in April 2016, we've had 508, including today, North Dakota's graduate. And that, that is quite some number. So let me just break it down a little bit. Um, 135 of those 508 have been women, which we're very proud of, but actually we'd like that number to be close to 50% and not the sort of 30%, which is where it's at at the moment. Um, we've had some incredible career changes come through, of course. We've had people who have worked um, as cabin crew, EasyJet for eight years. We've had people who've worked as a football coach. We've had people who have worked as a farmer. Um, we've got someone who's been a busker. Someone who, uh, currently on the course, is a station, used to be a station announcer at Piccadilly Station, one of my favourites at the moment. Um, and on a personal note, actually this 500th graduation also marks me having a personal friend on the course who graduates today. And he used to be a studio engineer at the world famous Blueprint Studios. So yes, you are a diverse bunch. Um, we've grown as a company from two members of staff to 38 members of staff. We're in two cities um, and we might have won a few awards. It was almost exactly a year ago to, to this week that we won Business of the Year nationally for the Chamber of Commerce. So it's been a brilliant journey and we're so pleased that everyone that's watching uh, on, online and everyone here has been part of that journey and we are excited about growing this business, growing more students and growing more opportunities over the years to come from when we moved to Manchester Technology Centre in January. So thank you so much for everyone to being here today and thank you so much um, yeah, for all the support that you've given us and all of the, uh, just, just give, putting your faith in us to, uh, to, to help you uh, on your careers as junior developers. So without further ado, let's get on with this graduation showcase. We have three wonderful teams uh, presenting to you today. Um, as ever, uh, we'll do each presentation and there'll be question time for questions afterwards. Um, and you just type those questions in the box underneath or you ask me at the end. Um, the first team, they, uh, they, they've created an AR, AR app. They were going to be called Our Kid, <laughs> but they plumbed for Manchester! Hello everyone and welcome to our presentation. We are Ruth, Bram, Luke, Chris and Killian and we are Team Manchester. For our project we have created an augmented reality tour of Manchester music locations. Some of you may have seen some AR tech in some recent presentations but we feel that our app offers something unique and original. We've combined a little bit of the old with the new and technology with the art with a little bit of sightseeing thrown in for good measure. Given Manchester's rich musical history, there are no shortage of tours operating in the city, but none of them offer the interactive experience that we do. On loading, our app presents the users with a map showing the musical landmarks and the user's location, along with an AR screen which shows the target icons for each of the locations. Rather than sticking to a rigid tour map and having to visit sites they have no interest in, with our app, the user is free to visit any site they wish and in any order they wish. I think we're all music fans in the group and the idea of incorporating augmented reality and something of a musical relevance was really exciting to us. We're very happy with how this app turned out and we hope you'll enjoy the presentation. Um, I'll now pass you over to Bram who will take you through a demo of the app. Hello everybody. Um, so um, as Ruth said, we um, What's come up with an um, AR app that um, showcased Manchester's um, live venues and speci especially some of the places that aren't there anymore. Um, so we had a, an initial idea of um, using AR to map on um, old images of, of venues that no longer exist. So you could actually go to those venues and sort of be taken back in time. Um, but what we realised quite quickly is the actual availability of sort of good images for all of these locations is, is a little bit sparse. 
So we, we, we kind of changed it up a little bit and decided to go for a, a portal option. So once you get actually get to the location, a portal appears and you can then actually enter the portal and be taken into um, a 360 degree image of like the world of that location. So uh, yeah, I'll give you a little uh, a little demo now. Sorry, Brown. Oh. <laughs> I'll give you a little demo now. <laughs> There we go. Cool. So uh, on loading up the, the app, Enter Tour, uh, you can see along the bottom uh, there's a number of key locations of places that you might want to, to visit on the, on the map. And that little blue dot there is telling you where your exact location is right now. Um, the, the app encourages you to move forward so it can calibrate your, your uh, position. And as you can see, there's arrows pointing down giving you indicators of where the nearest places are that you might want to visit. You can see the Hacienda there is vaguely in that direction. And so let's uh, go and have a look at the Free Trade Hall. Uh, there's a big arrow to tell you where to go, so let's hurry up. And uh, obviously pausing to make sure we're crossing the road okay. It's very important to get health and safety right when you're using AR. So um, as you can see, you can still see the points of interest uh, up in the air got the Hacienda and Free Trade Hall in the distance, so let's head there now. And we're there. So uh, once you actually enter the sort of nearby radius, um, the uh, yeah, it'll change at the bottom. You've arrived at the Free Trade Hall and you can click Enter Venue. And you've got some further information about the venue, but hello, what's happening here? Portals appeared. Should we go and have a look inside? And as you see, we've got a 360 degree image of the interior of the auditorium. There's some shots of famous Bob Dylan gig, uh, some posters. Uh, Sex Pistols also did a very famous gig there that sort of was the, the catalyst for a lot of uh, Manchester music in the 80s and 90s. Uh, you might have spotted reality appearing there again. So, yeah, I walk back out again. And turn around, and portal still there. And then you can just scroll down and read further information about the venue. So yeah, I'm now going to pass you over to Luke, who's going to tell you about the AR element. Fantastic, thank you very much. <coughs> um, so the portal itself has a nice wow factor to it, which is nice. Um, but it's actually not the hardest part of what we did. The trickiest bit was the placing the arrows and the text in real world locations and tracking you as you move around in the real world. Um, because the technology we were using called Viro React um, is really designed for placing things relative to the user's current location rather than placing things in a real world position. Um, so it works on a coordinate system that you can see there, X, Y, and Z, um, where the Z direction is always whatever's in front of the camera when you start up the app. Um, so if you want to place a portal in front of the user, that's dead easy. Just put it at 0x, 0y, minus 2z, and it pops up right in front of you. So that's nice and simple. Um, but, of course, we wanted to be able to place markers at real-world locations. So, for example, if we were wanting to target the Alan Turing Memorial, nothing to do with music, I'm afraid, that was just a convenient point on the map to point to, um, then we would need to convert our latitude and longitude coordinates um, into something relevant to the current user's location. Um, so we start by converting latitude and longitude to a system called Web Mercator, which is the coordinate system that Google Maps, Bing Maps, things like that use. Um, it's a 2D projection, um, obviously, of our spherical Earth, so you convert from latitude and longitude to that. Um, next, we then need to calculate the offset that's going to allow us to place markers at the correct position in the real world. But, of course, all of that is thinking about position. We also need to think about rotation and what angle everything needs to be at to us. Um, so the user could be facing any direction at all when they start the app up. We really don't know. Um, one option for dealing with that is just to ask the user to face north. The trouble is that's actually quite tricky for people to do in a city with lots of buildings around. They could perhaps use their phone compass, or we could use their phone compass to figure out which direction they're pointing. Um, unfortunately, we found that phone compasses are hilariously inaccurate. Um, and of course, if you are you know, 20 degrees-ish off from the correct heading as we are there, then you can see that the marker point ends up nowhere near the real-world location. That would be extremely confusing. The third option, the one we went for, 
is to use the GPS to calibrate the position that people are actually um, facing. Um, so what we do when we start the app up, if we could pop to the next slide, is that we place a notice in front of the user using that minus Z coordinate, um, asking them to walk forward along that Z axis. And then we take their position that they start at from GPS, we measure their position as they move, um, again, with some complications about having to think about the accuracy of those GPS coordinates, because phone GPS is also not all that accurate, down to maybe eight or nine meters. So we have to get them to walk a reasonable distance along that Z-axis, monitoring their GPS position, and then we can calculate what their true bearing is compared to what we assumed it was, calculate an offset, and then all of our previously calculated um, 2D coordinates for our markers, we then need to shift around by that offset that we've calculated. Um, and hopefully end up with markers in correct positions. Thank you very much. I'll hand you over to Killian. Oh, sorry, no. Here is Chris. Hi, uh, I'm Chris, part of Project Manchester, and I'm here to talk about a tech stack. Uh, I'm going to talk first of all about the bottom row, because on the bottom row are all the technologies that we wanted to use, that we'd planned to use, uh, and we spent the first week spiking and testing and doing loads of coding these technologies, but for various reasons, uh, which Killian will explain next, we couldn't use them. Uh, <laughs> so next slide, please, Ruth. So these are the technologies we ended up using. Uh, first two, Viro and React Native. Viro is built on React Native, so those two are the package. Uh, Viro provides all the augmented uh, reality tools and components that we use, such as the portal you've seen. Uh, React Native is the the uh, system, the user interface that uh, was used. Uh, we'll move on to go, our little gopher there. We picked that because of... <coughs> who wouldn't pick gophers? <laughs> uh, no, it's... it's uh, yeah, we we brought this in late in the day, uh, and we had to build the back end on it in a very, very short space of time. Uh, but it has an extensive built-in library, and it requires minimal external packages, uh, and it works very well with our next tech, which is Postgres, uh, PostgreSQL. Uh, and the two interact uh, via a relationship management tool that uh, Go uses called GORM. Uh, and the final one is JavaScript, which is basically what React uh, Native and Viro are built on. Uh, right, so that is me. I am going to pass you over to Killian for our challenges and successes. Killian. Hi, everyone. So every project will have challenges, especially one that has to be done within two weeks and one that uses completely new tech. Um, one of the main hurdles that we faced was actually um, using Vero React itself. Um, it's obviously based on React Native. React Native, uh, the newest version, 0.6, has an auto-linking feature, which means any libraries you need to bring in can just be imported. Um, we used for Vero uh, React version 0.59. You have to use um, something called React Native Link. Uh, this will allow you to import any libraries you need. But we had an issue with Vero in that it didn't seem to work. Um, with uh, Vero, the linking, which meant that we couldn't use um, libraries such as the navigation or the map. So to overcome this, uh, with the map, we use a static image, and we were able to program the different location uh, loca or landmark locations, and um, also the actual uh, user's position as well. And for the navigation, which is basically navigating between different screens or the overlays that you've seen, um, we were able to just conditionally render these. Um, we Obviously used Go for our back end. Uh, Chris mentioned we didn't have a lot of time to, uh, to implement this. The reason for that is because originally we wanted to use Firebase. Uh, we had tested making requests to that. We were able to retrieve data. But uh, due to the linking problem with Vero, uh, we couldn't use Firebase because it also had to be imported. So uh, in that case, we just moved to Go as a back end, and it seemed to work um, just fine. Uh, some other little issues we had, um, instead of the arrow that you've seen, uh, we were going to use a dome to indicate the position of the landmarks. Um, however, when we tried to implement this with Vero, um, it just wasn't um, quite accurate uh, geographically, so we just went with the arrows, which works quite well. And also there's a little issue with uh, debugging. Obviously, we had to field test this, um, 
So when Luke went out uh, in the city, any error he'd had come across, he'd have to come all the way back to, uh, to test and fix. Um, so there's a lot of successes, obviously, with challenges come successes. Um, the first one would be um, our utilization of our agile methodology. So anytime we encountered a challenge or a problem, um, obviously that would sort of change our navigation slightly. So we would get together with stand-ups uh, just to make sure everyone was on board with what changes had to be implemented. Um, we were also able to rearrange the Kanban board that we were using. Um, that was so everyone was aware of what tasks that they need to be on. Um, of course, exposure with new tech, like all projects, we use complete new technology, um, apart from PSQL. Um, obviously, quite a challenge. We moved out of our comfort zone. Um, and although some things, well, we encountered some challenges working with them, it was very exciting to, to try new things. Um, I'd say the main lesson learned from this is that it's not the end of the world if things don't work the way you want the first time around. Um, that's why you do your spiking, obviously, and your rat tests. So we found it was best, or well, first of all, communication was absolutely key, uh, just to keep everyone up to date with whatever changes we had to make. Um, so we relied heavily on Agile methodology for this, again, with the stand-ups and the Kanbans. Um, so yeah, if you encounter any stumbling blocks, it's fine to change. Um, just make sure everyone knows what they're doing, and uh, you'll get there in the end. That is the end of our presentation. Thank you very much for listening. Any questions? <laughs> I think we might only have one working mic, so I'm going to use this one and hand it back, so bear with me. Um, amazing app. Uh, I know that I was blown away when I came into the project room the other day and Bram walked me into the free trade hall back in, what, 1976? Yeah, the year of my birth. So I how old I am. But yeah, no, it's a beautiful, beautifully well-made app. I'm going to kick off with a question, actually. Um, how did you find using Go? You are the first project team to use Golang. How did you find using it? Uh, yeah, I, I spent two or three solid days using Go. It was pretty difficult. It's very strictly typed language, and it, it's very unforgiving. Uh, any little mistakes, uh, and you're just banging your head against the wall. Uh, that being said, <laughs> uh, yeah, I... I don't know if I'll ever come across it again in the future, but I think with some time, yeah, it's a very good language. Excellent. It is coming back into trend, have you, have you know, so it's not a terrible skill to have learned. Right, who in the room has got a question? Where am I going? Over here. Right, so, um, like, AR is... Like I, from someone who's just like at the end of back end, that seems to be like a mad leap to like go to. At what point in your, like your North Coders journey did you look at that and think, yeah, we can do that? <laughs> um, I would say that was right at the start of project phase. Really, it was it was an idea that so Bram had the idea about the sort of the theme and what we wanted the app to do, and it was at that point that we thought, yeah, maybe AR could link in with this. Um, there were some definite challenges to it, but it's with something like like Vira has its challenges in terms of integrating with other stuff, but it's a really fantastic library to work with. It makes certain aspects of the AR very, very easy. Um, so like the portal we had up and running within a day or two. Um, in fact, I think on the first day we had a portal going. Um, it, it is that quick to get going. Um, the stuff about the real world location obviously takes a bit more work, and that's what I've spent most of the last three weeks working on really. Um, but it's, yeah, it's, it's not too bad to get started. It's, it's very accessible. Were you impressed? <laughs> Good. <laughs> right, who else has got a question in the room? Over here. Hello. Uh, so knowing the challenges that you have faced, if you were to go back in time and give yourself advice at the beginning, what would you have changed? I mean, speaking for myself rather than the group, but I, I think we would have probably spent 
less time trying to get the other packages integrated with Viro. That was that wasted a lot of time for me, certainly in the the first week of work. Um, so looking back, I'd have, you know, hindsight's a wonderful thing. So I think, you know, it would have been fine to try try out some of those things because some of them were really useful packages. But I think ultimately we should have probably cut it off sooner and said, look, this isn't working. Let's pivot towards what we did pivot towards, which was doing more of the app in AR, um, making the AR as kind of what was a big feature for us anyway, making it really central to the app, um, and then making everything else work around that, which which worked out in the end, but it took us a while to, to make that kind of pivot. Time for one more question in the room. Everyone's being very shy online, so please don't be shy in the room. Come on, Shaq, I'm looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> no, exactly. Uh, so, no, no, right, okay. We, have to, we do have three teams, so we'll wrap this one up. Please put your hands together once more for Manchester! <laughs> and we'll be back in just a tick with the next team. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody, and I believe we have a treat in store for you, and they go by the team name of Wanda! Hello, world. I love traveling. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you! <laughs> uh, I love traveling, and I have always wished that an application like ours existed. I had an idea for a travel app for a very long time, but never, but there was always something missing until I woke up on the day of the pitching, I'm sorry, of the day of pitching app suggestions. So let me tell you a few words about our application. My name is Paulina, and this is my team. Dimitri, Sarah, Thomas, and Christian, and we are Wonder. So, uh, Wonder is an app designed for solo travelers looking to meet people to explore new locations with. The app allows you to see a map or a list of nearby attractions which are pulled from Google Maps API. You are able to see info about the location and select a date you would like to go and visit. Once you have chosen the location, you will automatically be entered into a chat with other users who will be going so that you can arrange a time to meet up. We hope that our app would make, would make life easier for travelers and give them the chance to meet new people and with similar interest. I'm really proud what we achieved and the way we pulled together as a team. One of our real strengths was our communication and trust in each other. So well done guys and now I will pass the microphone to Thomas who will walk you through our app. Thank you. Hello. So uh, I already installed my application to on my phone. Uh, San Francisco, and I already created the account. Let's see if this will work. <laughs> yeah. There you go. So I logged to my account. We can I see the places where I want to go? Check the map. How far is from my place? I picked the cathedral. Add to my agenda. Then I quickly check the rating and the distance for my place. And I will go to chat screen. I pick the for people going there. So type the message. And if I can join them. So I'm ready. Message sent. Quick check my profile. Take the quiz so I can get some recommendation about the places. Which you profile. Then quickly change my profile picture. And that's it. That's all up. Thank you very much. Now I pass you to Dimitris, he will walk you through front end. Thanks. Hi everybody. So uh, in terms of the front end, uh, we decided to go with React Native. 
Uh, we chose that for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first, we wanted to use something that was cross-platform compatible. And the second reason was that we wanted to use something that was up-to-date, uh, had good documentation and resources. We only had a couple of weeks, so for a new technology that we haven't used before, uh, we wanted to be able to get stuck in straight away and get up to speed with things. And I'm quite happy with how things have turned out. Um, for the front end, we had two major aims, so we wanted to make it look nice, first of all, of course. Uh, but we also wanted to make it a good user experience, so make it easy to use. Uh, we wanted the buttons to be obvious, we wanted the navigation to be obvious, and we wanted it not to be confusing for anyone who was working on the app. So we achieved that by making it a clean styling. Um, we wanted to be used just one main highlight color, and I think that is quite easy to use as you go along in the app. There's a few different sections on there where everything's quite obvious. I mean, in terms of the main challenges that we faced on the app, uh, the first thing was the actual navigation itself. As I mentioned, we've not used React Native before. Uh, it's quite a different setup to React that we use uh, during the course. So the navigation needed a lot of planning, uh, quite a lot of setup. But once we got it working, it was perfect. And it really lends itself to that mobile development. Uh, the second uh, challenge that we faced was integrating the external components. So as you've seen, we've got the map uh, component, the chat component as well. These were all things that needed to be linked into the actual app itself. Um, at first, it was a bit of a challenge to get them linked up and hooked up together with each other. There was some uh, interference on that regard, but we did manage to get that working in the end. I'm quite happy with how the app has turned out, and I hope you like it as much as we do. And I'll pass you on to Sarah, who will talk about the back end. Thanks, Dimitri. Okay, so for our back end, uh, we wanted to be able to store our user data. And we wanted to be able to store that very cleanly and flexibly. So as you can see on the right hand side of the screen, this is actually an example of what one of our users data looks like. They've got um, a profile, they've got a, an agenda section, and that's where they can add um, items of where they're wanting to go to. And they've also got a history for items that have passed. As you can see, each of the items um, has got an ID, a date, um, a chat key, and its actual name. And the chat key is what allows uh, the user to actually be added to the correct chats so that they can talk to other people that are actually going to um, places that they're interested in arrange to go together. So that's quite fundamental to our vision for getting people chatting could it make those arrangements together. Um, so we wanted something um, for our database that was very flexible. and We also wanted to be able to explore new technologies. So we decided to go for MongoDB as that allowed us um, a very flexible data model that would um, uh, allow us to easily add features. Um, to work with uh, MongoDB, we also wanted to research some new technologies to work um, to create our API. Um, we decided that we would go for um, Tornado, as our web application framework, which is um, coded in Python. And um, Motor is our um, uh, database driver that links Tornado and MongoDB together. Um, one of the challenges that we had um, with using Mongo, which is a NoSQL database, is that it doesn't actually give us a database schema. Um, that meant that um, we didn't have those natural schema checks for things like adding, uh, preventing us from adding um, duplicate users to the database and duplicate um, agenda items. So we had to be particularly careful in our coding that we made those checks. And that was where our unit tests really came into their own to ensure that we had all of those checks in our code and we could be really confident in our API. Thank you. I'm now going to pass on to Christian, who's going to tell us about the data structure and architecture. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you very much. How are we all doing? All right? Uh, first of all, can we give it up for my team? They've been awesome. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Um, so we have a front end, a back end, chats, uh, authentication. How does it all slot together? So the way that we did it, we used Firebase for the authentication. This basically accepts a user, user email, user password. Yeah, put that in. It gives you a nice UUID, and this is essential for driving our app. Our user profile requires a UUID to be able to access it. Um, that also drives the chat as well as part of the chat key. 
Uh, and, and that's how those two things slot together. The Python backend, as Sarah was saying, um, is, is handles the user profile um, with the flexible objects that we can all access. Um, Google Maps API was used uh, in the front end to get the location data. Unfortunately, that doesn't give you a user description. So we had to be a little bit more imaginative with getting the recommendation sorted because recommendations is kind of a new feature. I'm not going to lie, it was added towards the end of uh, development of the app. <laughs> and um, in order to do that, React Native doesn't uh, allow you to do scraping or anything within the app. So had to farm it out to a server um, with a Wikipedia scrape. Uh, and, uh, and that sends off information to, uh, to Watson, uh, which does personality analysis. Sends that off to the user profile, and there you go. If you've got uh, a user, if you've got user data which arrives from taking the quiz, uh, and uh, place data which arrives from the Wikipedia scrape, you can then see whether or not it's a it's a good match uh, in terms of place for you, and uh, Wanda will recommend for you. Um, can we hit the next slide, please? So the future of Wanda, we uh, obviously. Given the time constraints, we'd have liked to have made a few improvements, such as the chat functionality. Currently, it doesn't show you the name of the person who's uh, chatting to you, so that would be a nice thing to have. <laughs> um, another thing would be, you know, an add to calendar for, you know, your own personal phone calendar and whatnot. Um, refined user data and place description. So these two things sort of go hand in hand. If we can get better data, we can make better recommendations. And the way that it works, because each user can sort of have their own recommendations tailored to them, you'd kind of think that people with similar personalities or similar preferences, if you will, would end up going to similar places. Um, so it might be better. It might be. It might be worse. Who knows? <laughs> and then an internal review system, um, just for our users to be able to um, rate the places that they've been to. So, you know, we we encountered a fair amount of challenges, but I think as a team we pulled through them all, um, and we, we we believe that in the future there's definitely more more room for expansion improvement, um, and that's. That's about it. Uh, in the meantime, get wandering. Um, thank you very much. What a, uh, what a beautiful app. Well done, guys. That's amazing. Um, right. Are you not going to be shy again? Hey, there he is. Shaq. So it's a bit of a two-parter. Um, one, I noticed there were quite a few aspects to your architecture. One, was it planned? Two, if it wasn't planned, would you readjust the way it all ties in together in hindsight? Deep question. Uh, you don't know the answer to this, Shaq. <laughs> but what I will tell you is there was some more spontaneity, shall we say, in the development. Um, but actually, I think it works really well because it's flexible enough to cope, say, with many users or one. So um, in hindsight, yeah, probably a bit more planning, um, a little bit more about how the data would slot together. But we started off with a user object, and that grew as time went on. We added the recommendations feature, which would, um, you know, which, which sort of slots into an object and, 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 and moving the data between through React. It's, it's fun, but I think there's better ways of doing it, definitely. Anyone else? <laughs> Sorry, I was just getting excited. About 50, 50 people tuned in. That's our biggest number ever. So just getting excited about that. Um, right. Got a question from Daniel Miller, who is tuned in. And he, do you know Daniel? <laughs> How do you match the user data to the wiki scrape? Another one for me. Lovely. OK, so Watson very kindly um, takes text 
and analyzes it for a personality. And that personality sends back percentiles of different traits. Um, so the quiz that the user does, currently it's very rudimentary. Uh, it just generates a word pool um, of shy, outgoing, depending on where you put the sliders. Um, not just shy, outgoing, but whatever the sliders are. Can't quite remember now. Um, and then it sends that off for analysis to Watson. And then Watson returns that with what it thinks your personality is. And you can do the same with the place name. So Wikipedia scrapes is just everything that's on the Wikipedia page for that particular place. So I, I tested out Sagrada Familia. I tested out uh, National Football Museum. And it came back with different personalities, if you will, for the places that you want to go. And it uh, checks what that personality is compared to what your personality is. And if it's a close enough match, uh, I put the settings fairly broad so that you know we'd be recommending that you go to loads of places. Um, it will recommend it for you. That's the way it works. Time for one more in the room. Hello. Uh, so it's kind of building on that last one. Um, did you think about using people's Google map data, which would have lots of starred places that they like to go, and maybe like taking the personality information from that? Um, or is that possible? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> It's certainly possible if you've got about a million pounds. Um, <laughs> the amount of appy calls that we'd have to make for that. Um, well, not just that. It's how much do you want to rely on Google data versus your own user-generated data? That's, that was the question. And I think for us, we were like, well, it's our app. So why don't we make it our data that we use, by and large, as, mu as much as possible? Um, and eventually, I think you know, on the, on the futures slide. Uh, it, it kind of showed that we are looking to develop more data on places by having internal user ratings and, and stuff like that. that. That would kind of, you know, it's, it's a future path. Uh, but yeah, certainly something that we'd, we would consider and we have considered, but just too expensive at the moment. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, if anyone's got spare milli lying around. <laughs> Right, I think that brings that, this one to a close. You've done a brilliant job. Well done, Wanda! <laughs> and again, just two minutes, we're back with the next presentation. And for the final act for tonight's proceedings, I give you Monitor! Thank you very much for everybody coming to see our app today. Uh, all the current students, uh, tutors and potential hiring partners and to everybody who's tuned in online. Hello, Mum. <laughs> uh, so our app today is going to focus, it starts off with a little a bit of a sob story. So uh, if anyone likes the X Factor, you're going to love the next 20 seconds. I lived and worked in central London for three years. And at the end of it, I developed asthma. Nothing? No? <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, after this, uh, the doctor concluded it was probably genuinely the bad air quality that I was experiencing in London. That helped to influence us make our app Monitor. So the team today is Eamon, Becky, <coughs> Asthma, <laughs> <laughs> Billy and Chris. Um, so what we wanted to do with the app, we were really keen to get something that was practical, that was going to interact with hardware, because we saw somebody else do that, we thought it was really interesting and a really good chance to show off the skill set that we've acquired. We've been here for a few months and we've learned a methodology to learn new languages. This is something that we, we've really tested ourselves. I think the app that we're going to show you now, the tech stack that we're going to demonstrate as well, is really testament to that. Um, I'm really proud of the team for everything we've done. And I think now we're going to start a demo of the app. So this is the live screen you would see. We're going to hear Dummy registering somebody. We've got error messages which are client side and server side. This means, for example, if you put in a password that was too short, it wouldn't work. Or as you can see there, if you put in an already existing email, that won't work. Everybody must have a, a unique username, 
sensor ID and password. On our home screen here, you can see we measure air quality, which is an index out of 500, uh, temperature and humidity. The colors also change depending on how things are going. For example, here we spiked it. Um, the temperature you can see has now gone to a recommended low temperature and it was a high dangerous air quality. We monitor the air quality, this is day by day. All the spikes you can see is where we've been testing it to make sure that we're getting valid constant readings. Where it was a lot more flat, that's where we've not been playing around with it. Uh, so we're going through day by day here and if you get to somewhere where we haven't got a reading yet, you get the error message. We've also got responsive messaging appearing below. So this will say day by day, this was your best, lowest reading. Can you guess why? And then we list some of the practical ways that you can go about this and the dangers of, um, the dangers of too high or too bad uh, air quality. Um, uh, we can see here that we're also measuring temperature and humidity. So we're going to go back uh, to the, well, that's the end of the first page. And this is very much for the people, I'd say, in this part of the room. So I'm going to ask for some more audience participation again here. Um, I'm hopefully mentioned that this is a smart app. The reason for that is it's not just telling you, right, here is our air quality, here is our humidity. We also want it to be responsive to do something. So the output from this is if the air quality gets too bad, then it's meant to be able to function something. So here it's just lighting up an LED, but that is representative of, for example, switching on air, humidifier, if you're really good, opening a window, something like this. So the, uh, the app monitors minute by minute, uh, or updates minute by minute, but the temperature second by second, we put a pen to it, and by hopefully wave applause from this side, if you can see the light. <laughs> Somebody did. So yeah, if people couldn't see that, the light switched on when we put a pen towards the sensor, and that's because the, uh, the air quality wasn't good enough. I'm now going to pass you on to Chris, and he's going to talk you through the next part. OK, so I'm going to give you an overview of the architecture now, which is basically the bird's eye view of uh, how we put things together. So we start off with the sensor, which I'll show you in a second. It's adorable, by the way, incredibly small. That posts data um, or sends its data into the Pi. Optionally, as you saw now, uh, you can opt to switch on a device if the temperature gets to a certain point or if the pollution gets to a certain point. And it was a design decision. A lot of the uh, concern with IoT devices is actually that, you know, they're not incredibly secure. They're often left unmaintained. We opted just to send data only to the cloud in this case. We save the data to a database and the user um, goes via the back end, unknowingly of course, to retrieve the data from the database. Now we're going to get onto the hardware. Now sometimes, you know, some of us like cat videos, right? I love hardware. And this is, this is adorable. This thing is impossibly small, OK? Just look at that. <laughs> OK, it's adorable. It is a um, sensor made by Bosch. Uh, they're well known for making uh, sensors for factory systems and so on. Um, only 10 cubic millimeters in size. It measures with incredible accuracy uh, temperature, pressure, humidity, and volatile organic compounds. So things like uh, benzene, nail varnish, flea spray, etc. alcohol. So you could breathe on it after a night out and uh, that would light up. So that is mounted on a board uh, because it's actually an eight pin land grid array. So it's impossible to solder, I mean it's tiny. Uh, and we plug this board into a breakout board which is mounted on the Raspberry Pi. The Raspberry Pi, is itself incredibly small, but still vastly overpowered for what we need. Um, it is um, it's quad core, it's got four gigs of RAM, four USB ports. It's basically all you need to, for most people to run the, as their desktop computer. It'll actually run two 4K displays. I mean, it's, it's incredible. 
It runs an incredibly lightweight version of Debian, something called Raspbian, made by the Raspberry Pi Foundation. When you boot in, it only takes 140 megabytes of RAM. It's incredibly efficient. And we wrote the main program in Python. So essentially what this does, it uh, takes a reading every second um, of all the, all the measurements coming from the sensor, eventually takes an average of those about once a minute, and then posts the data up to the server. And it does that on an infinite loop. I'm now going to pass you over to Eamon, who is going to go into a bit more detail on the back end. So I'm just going to talk you through our back-end tech stack. So as you've seen, we have a uh, sensor which is posting to a database. So what we needed to set up was a RESTful API. The first decision we had to make was which language to do. So we decided to use Python. Why Python? It's great for data handling and is extremely readable. So because we were all picking up a new language, it was really important for us to be able to read each other's code without having to go over, ask each other questions, and, and understand it better. So Chris might write something in the morning. I might take over on the back end in the afternoon. I could read his, uh, his code quite easily because it was written in Python. So that was the reason why we chose Python. It's also great because we were teaching ourselves. So there was a great online community, um, a very much similar to JavaScript, where you can Google anything and you will get an answer. And that definitely would have been more difficult had we chosen a different language. The web framework we use is called Flask, which is the most popular uh, web framework for Python, and it's very similar to Express, if anyone's familiar with that. And it was clear, concise, easy to use, and uh, it was very similar to Express, which we were familiar to, so the way it handles routes, etc., were, were the same. So the app spoke to a database, which was, and the edge of that database was SQLite. There we go. And uh, we spoke to our SQLite database using, uh, using Flask SQL Alchemy. And what that is, it's a little toolkit that is added onto Python that allows you to write um, SQL code in Python. The reason we went with SQLite is because it's simple and lightweight, and it's actually almost perfect for Internet of Things devices, which is what we had. So we only had really simple databases, uh, so really simple tables in our database um, that weren't particularly complex, so SQLite was perfect for our needs. All our endpoints in our API were tested using a great package called Tavern. And Tavern is like a really lightweight, beautifully written uh, testing package for testing your requests and your response, so you're getting back what you expected. Um, this is something that would give anyone in the fundamentals uh, block a nightmare. The, it, it's written in a language called YAML, and the Y in YAML stands for YAML, which makes it a recursive acronym. And finally, when it came time to host, we hosted on Python Anywhere. We originally thought, we presumed we could use Heroku. Turned out later in the day that we couldn't use Heroku because they didn't support SQLite. So we went out hunting for a, new, for a new host. And Python Anywhere did everything that we needed it to do. They had great user guides. Again, perfect for us, self-teaching. We were very much on our own. So we had uh, the support of like an online community and some really good user guides and docs and everything else. So Python Anywhere was everything that we needed to do. So I'm now going to pass it over to Becky, who's going to talk to you through our front-end tech stack. Bonjour, everybody. Um, I've been tasked with talking you through the wonderful front-end that we've created. So without further ado, here's our front-end tech stack. I was expecting more excitement. Thank you. Thank you. So number one on this week's top of tech stack was React Native. Um, so when we first started out designing our app, we were toying between using Flutter or React Native. The reason that we ended up choosing React Native after spiking both was because React Native is a very widely used framework, so there's a lot of support. Um, you could very much get an answer for any question that you may have. Um, the docs are fantabulous. And um, it built on the React knowledge that we learn on North Coders, but still had enough of a learning curve that it was a totally new experience. Alongside React Native, we used TypeScript. And the reason that we chose TypeScript is because it allows you to be explicit with anything that you're declaring. So any variable, you can say, this must be a number, this must be a string, whatever. And also with functions, you could say that, you know, we expect three arguments, they must all be x, y, and z. So this made it great for a large group working on the same project that, you know, maybe if I had created a function, John jumps on front end, doesn't know 
100% what it's doing, it'll tell him in real time, well, this function takes the arguments, you've only given me one, what's going on? Um, we also decided that it would be good to learn a core language rather than just a framework. Um, the reason for this is because frameworks can come and go. One day React Native might not exist, but TypeScript will probably always exist. There will always be another TypeScript framework. Um, we used Expo. Expo is the framework that we used to develop and build our app to Android and iOS. Um, Expo was great because it allowed us to see what we were doing in real time on our phones, how it looked, how it worked, make sure all the functionality was correct. Um, it also has a very quick build time, so when we've been building our app to both Android and iOS, it's been rapid. It also uses a t the same React Native TypeScript um, code base, and it also has excellent docs. Um, Firebase is what we use to handle the login and registration authentication of our users. So we decided really early on that this was a feature that was important um, because it's very secure. We did not want to handle any passwords on our back end because security. Um, yeah, also it has really great docs. So again, self-learning, great docs, so important. Always read docs. Um, Formidable is the package that we used to create and design our graphs. Um, we chose this over React Native charts because, again, the docs were really great and they were really user friendly. And it, once you got the learning curve, <laughs> It was fairly straightforward to make great looking graphs. Uh, I think that's I think that's it. I'll pass you to Billy, who's going to talk you through the trials, tribulations, and lessons learned. Thank you. Thank you, Becky. Hello. So uh, I'm going to first of all go through what we've learned. So behind me, I've got sort of our tech stack graveyard, as it were. We gave these a good go, but ended up not using them. So for the back end, we always knew we were going to use Python. Like we were pretty set on that, but there were two kind of frameworks that we thought we had to choose between, the main ones being Django and Flask. Um, and honestly, Django is pretty good. I feel like you can get a lot done with it. But the reason we went with Flask is it's just laid out in a very similar way to Express, which we learned on the course. It's more lightweight and, once again, beautiful docs, lovely. Um, and then for the front end, we, uh, we were thinking between Flutter and Dart and TypeScript and React Native. And we gave both of them quite a long go, but the problem with Flutter and Dart is they're really hard to install, like a lot of breakages occurred, and they don't run on slow computers at all, and we had some slow computers, so it seemed natural to go with TypeScript and React, which is very low-spec friendly. Um, so now I'm gonna move on to the, how we worked well as a team, isn't that a nice way to end? Oh. Um, so we did all the standard Agile stuff. We had a lovely uh, Kanban board, and we did a lot of stand-ups, but you know, everyone does that, so hey-ho. Um, I think probably the main thing we did to work well as a team is we were pretty good at identifying like, where the bottlenecks were going to occur, like the things that, if they weren't done, nothing else could be done. And we were good at sort of assigning more people to the bottlenecks than the other bits, so that they never ended up being too much of bottlenecks. Um, but other than that, yeah, we just did standard kind of like, you know, pair program if you're struggling on something, mob program if you're really struggling on something. And yeah, it, I feel like we worked very well as a team and it was wonderful. Um, and that's about all from us, to be honest. So thank you very much for listening. And are there any questions? That was incredible. Wow, no one's ever done an app like that before. So well done, congratulations. It is going off on YouTube. I'm gonna read you some comments. <laughs> uh, from, from our friends Nick and Fraser. Looking great, guys. So Jobo, take my money. <laughs> Anna Sutton, fa fantastic app. Well done, guys. Um, someone who is called Dr. Salen. Indoor air quality is the next big thing for Public Health England. This is really exciting. Wow. And then, question from Paul, or is it Tom? I don't know. Um, how do, did you handle all of the air monitoring data? Did you send it to the database every second? 
Yeah, so we, we quickly found out uh, that the backend framework that we were using, we were on the, on the free team, um, being students, you know, um, it would quickly kick us off if we posted every second. Um, so what it does, the, the Raspberry Pi, you know, taking the average of 60 readings, 1,000 readings, it's a walk in the park for it. It really is. So it builds up a list of each reading every second over the course of a minute or 10 minutes or whatever we choose to give it. In our case, we ended up with a minute. Uh, takes an average of them and then sends it up. Thank you. Right, come on. Let's not be shy of this final presentation. Shaq, thank you. Keeping the room warm. So I know that Expo tends to abstract a lot of the things going on under the hood away from you. So did that cause any issues with using any third party libraries or any additional tech at all? Um, yes, yeah, so using sort of third party libraries like Victory Charts and Firebase um, took us down some, on reflection, very stupid rabbit holes. Um, so when I was, when we were trying to set up the Firebase authentication, we were originally looking at, you know, React Native Firebase, you know, we're using React Native, it should work. And Expo is obviously totally different. So <laughs> that was, you know, on reflection. Um, there was also a lot of sort of trouble using victory charts, getting them to render properly. Um, I mean, we got there in the end, but it caused a lot of <laughs> headaches, definitely. I think the charts especially were, were um, yeah. And that was, that was sort of one of the sort of things that Billy touched on about being adaptable, like that's something we expected to take like 10 minutes, so we'll knock that out, like on the day it'll be fine, and it's like two days worth of work just trying to get a chart to load on the screen. So don't underestimate what needs to be done. <laughs> Thank you. Right, Josh Porter online. Anyone know Josh? Yeah. Uh, how did you find the hardware developer experience? Things break a lot. How was it stable, and how did you react? So I won't take too much credit because a lot of the harder work was Chris, as you can see, he's extremely into that stuff. Um, but yeah, I, I think overall we had some relatively good experiences apart from uh, postal delays, which was one of the, the big things. We didn't have a sensor when we were expecting one, which obviously delayed our project by quite a bit. Um, but uh, And then also we, we did have some trouble with, uh, we brought a switch because what we wanted to do rather than a light is we really wanted to switch on a motor, then we could have operated something, like we you know, open a little, uh, like a box or something to display it opening a ventilation system or switching on an air purifier. But unfortunately, we, we uh, you know, uh, the, the motor that we had simply didn't work, and we just had to adapt around it and and be flexible. But yeah, that's where we are. Oh, we'll start over here and we'll walk that way across. Another hardware-related question: How did you decide to do it, and was it difficult to sort of get up and going compared to doing something more software? Techie based. Got to do my challenge Annika thing here, I keep forgetting. Uh, it would have been a hell of a lot harder if we'd had to program it in C or something. Um, but we, we did a lot of frantic Googling um, on the on the Monday morning. There are probably hundreds of these sensors available. Um, we ended up going for one uh, from Pimaroni. Um, as you can tell by the name, they're like a, a Raspberry Pi shop they sell lots of raspberry pi bbc micro arduino kind of stuff um and this board just seemed quite user friendly um it has a python library that goes with it and that abstracts away from the c library that uh, bosch um provide um so probably in a factory system we'd have used um probably we would have used c but we only had two weeks and there were only five of us and uh, C is hard, <laughs> so um, so it made sense just to go for the uh, you know the board with the the Python support because uh, we uh, you know we needed sleep. So excellent and final question I think for today goes to Ian. How sensitive is that thing? If I took a swig of beer right now and breathed on it, would it light up? Does anyone have a beer? <laughs> 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 so. The answer was a resounding. Yes. 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 Very. Thank you. Cool. 
What an absolutely incredible app. I think final round of applause goes to Monitor! <laughs> so those that know, um, as I said, we we're celebrating our 500th North Coda graduate today. For those that know, I was one of the first 10 that ever graduated from this course and have not written a line of code in anger since July 2016. Watching those apps today has made me really want to pick up my keyboard again and write more code. Hopefully that's inspired another generation of North Coders. Thank you so much for coming. We'll see you again in three weeks!